currently working with uh, hundreds of police leaders all over the world, trying to help them develop better knowledge for better policing that can prevent crime and reduce the amount of human suffering that is caused by crime and injustice everywhere in the world. What I do in large part is to help police leaders read what is already known about what works in policing and what doesn't work, but I also help them do their own research and become what we call pracademics because they are practitioners and they are academics, so we call them pracademics. And we have a journal for police leaders to publish their research in. It's called the Cambridge Journal of Evidence-Based Policing. I have been working on and off at Cambridge University uh, for 48 years uh, when I first came there as a student after I started my career in the New York City Police Department where I was a crime analyst working mostly on police corruption because at the time there was a major investigation of corruption and a major reform of corruption in the New York City Police Department led by the great legendary police commissioner Patrick B. Murphy who had attended university before he became a New York City police officer, a remarkable thing in its day. And he also led the campaign when he was head of police in Washington, D.C. in 1968, when the great civil rights protester Martin Luther King was killed, there were riots. And the mayor of Chicago called out nationally on police to shoot the looters, the people who were breaking the windows of the stores and taking the goods out uh, as part of the protest of the murder of Martin Luther King. But Patrick Murphy in Washington said, don't shoot the looters, they're just committing a property crime. We don't kill people for property crimes. And he set the moral leadership for policing in his generation. Three years later, I meet him in New York City when he's the police commissioner and he picks me to work uh, in his research and planning uh, unit um, on the number one problem of the day, which was how to reduce police corruption, but also on community policing and a number of other programs that he uh, initiated. And I went from there uh, to uh, study at Cambridge with uh, uh, Scotland Yard and uh, the British policing model, uh, which uh, I was very taken with because the British are far more conscious about minimizing the use of force. They, of course, don't even carry guns and they are able to deal with people who have guns without shooting them. Um, even men who take a machete and cut somebody's head off, the British police will take him into custody rather than killing him. Uh, so with one of the most nonviolent police forces in the world, roughly the same size as New York City, where the year I worked there, there were over 90 people were killed by the New York City Police Department. But Patrick Murphy, the legendary police leader, was able to cut that down eventually to about 10 a year, which is where it's been uh, ever since he launched the initiatives of training and research to understand the police shooting issue and to have the people respect the police because they don't kill so indiscriminately. Uh, whenever they find it more convenient to kill than to take the time to apprehend people without uh, killing them. And that kind of proportionate policing is really uh, a philosophical or ethical foundation for evidence-based policing. The, the only reason you care about what works in policing is that you want to prevent harm from happening. And part of that harm could be that the police have to kill people in order to stop them from killing others. But if you can help to manage criminal careers so they don't go down the pathway of carrying guns and shooting people, uh, then the police can be much more uh, effective in diverting people from a life of crime. So a lot of what we uh, do is to study ways of taking first offenders and making that their last offense rather than expect that they're going to be part of a career of offending. And it is true that the earlier people commit serious crimes, shooting somebody when they're 12 or 13 years old, the more dangerous they will be for the rest of their lives. But at least in England, uh, in the United States, most first offenders never have another offense. And so we now have developed this thing called offender assistance policing, uh, which is aimed at making a first offender a last offender 
and we are succeeding in at least reducing the amount of further harm they cause when they commit more crimes. Uh, and we do this through this thing called a controlled trial, prosecuting half of them and diverting the other half to a program of rehabilitation, getting them to talk about not committing crime in the future, changing their lives, getting a job, being a better citizen. And this is the approach that is now uh, shown to work through research in Britain and uh, up to 10 police departments of the 43 in England and Wales are adopting this program uh, as a way to prevent crime. Um, also adopting other programs such as putting police patrols where the crime is concentrated rather than spreading it out all over the place. We have done many experiments. Uh, uh, my colleagues and I, since we did the first experiment in uh, Minneapolis, have had other academics repeat our experiments, always getting good results at concentrating patrols up to 15 minutes in one location and then going away, coming back unpredictably. Um, and most recently we've shown that if they don't come for four days to a hotspot, the first four days it's not so bad, and then on the fifth day there's a 400% increase in the amount of harm that the crime is causing in the location. It's a, a sudden explosion of, of crime harm after that four day period. Um, and now we're developing tools like a, a digital tracking alarm that will go off if, uh, if it's been four days since a police patrol car has been in this location. And we say, get the police there quickly before the, the crime starts to get really very serious. And that preventive outlook is what our students and our alumni, our graduates, are talking about when we have an annual meeting in Cambridge in July. First week of July every year now, we meet in Cambridge to discuss the latest knowledge uh, and how to apply that knowledge to have police be more effective and use the minimum force necessary to prevent harm and suffering. In my first year in policing, I met uh, a Spanish-born police chief, uh, Anthony Boza, from Galicia, uh, who came to New York when he was 14 and went into policing uh, when he was 21 and rose to become head of the research and planning division in New York and then went on to, New to Minneapolis in Minnesota, a very cold country, where uh, I came to him and said, could we do an experiment in which we arrest some people and we give other people a warning for uh, wife beating, for domestic abuse? And he said, sure, we'll go to the city council. And the city council actually gave us unanimous approval to run uh, the first medical style controlled clinical trial to see whether it's better to arrest or not to arrest. And in that particular study, it turned out to be uh, better to arrest. And so we said, we have to repeat the study to see if we get the same findings. So we go to Milwaukee and we have a police chief who believes in arrest and he wanted to do the experiment to show that arrest worked. And he went to the city council and the city council said yes, unanimously. We repeated the experiment and we got a different result. <laughs> the result was that actually arrest works for people who have a job, but it doubles the amount of domestic violence for people who don't have a job. And so if you make arrest conditional on employment, you wind up in an ethical dilemma because in effect, you arrest people if they have a job. And so you punish them for working and that's not the right thing to do. But if you have neighborhoods where most people are unemployed compared to neighborhoods where most people are unemployed, you could have a neighborhood level um, policy. In any case, by doing those experiments, we clearly set the precedent for using an experimental approach to test policing that in ways that it had not been done anywhere except one experiment in Northern England in 1963. But to get into the American system as early as 1981 with the first experiment and then having them replicated in Britain, we're now up to over 200 randomized controlled trials that have been at least started, if not fully reported yet, by police. So the, the curve of police experiments is going way up. And um, what's happening now is that I don't go to police agencies and propose an experiment. What happens is that we have students who come to Cambridge and study, and we say, somebody should do an experiment on this. And then they come to me and say, for my master's thesis, I'd like to do this experiment. 
and I say, good, let's design it so it'll be a very good experiment. Some of the experiments work pretty well, others have more challenges, but um, right here in Denmark, they just finished a very good experiment in deterring organized crime and uh, discouraging the leaders of the organized crime gangs from recruiting new uh, offenders to their gangs because of this knock-knock approach of the police warning the leaders of the co-offending networks that they should stop recruiting and they should stop offending and it's not a huge effect but it does reduce crime it does reduce uh, some of the consequences of what organized crime is doing in Denmark but what's most important is that the way this experiment happened was this student from Denmark sits in my class in Cambridge and then a few months later uh, we have a phone call scheduled and I say what would you like to do your thesis on he, and he said I'd like to do this experiment which is similar to one that was done in Sacramento, California. And I said, okay, can you design this? Can you design that? And we worked it all out. And he took the blueprint, came back to Denmark. He did the experiment with a supervisor, uh, Dr. Barack Ariel, who has done many experiments of his own, body-worn video cameras, uh, as well as uh, tasers and other things. Um, the leader of the experiment was the Danish student, who happened to work in the police commissioner's office, um, and had access to authority to make a good experiment. But we're moving now to the era in which most police experiments are being done by academics. And that is the sustainable approach. Just like in medicine, most medical experiments are being led by doctors, not by basic researchers. Uh, so I'm very optimistic that we have uh, created a tipping point towards practitioners running their own experiments, designing their own experiments, publishing their own experiments, and changing police practice based on experimental evidence. Well, there's two strategies that uh, you can think of, one of which has been tried a lot, it's top-down. And so, since 1996, the University of Cambridge has been educating people who are about to become police chiefs. And it was originally required by law that the police chiefs take a, a one-year part-time course at Cambridge. Um, that didn't have as much effect as the later course, which was more specifically focused on evidence-based policing with a master's degree project in the second year. And by having police do their own research for their master's thesis, before they become police chiefs, gives them much more interest in research, much more appreciation of research. And having done it themselves, they can encourage others to do it with more legitimacy. Uh, don't just do as I say, do as I did. Mm -hmm. If I did research, then you can do research, and let's study this problem to get the right answer for good policing. So that's working well, but it's slow, because there's only so many people who can uh, be sent from the top of police organizations at any given time. If you were to go the other way around and start with every police recruit being taught evidence-based policing for every aspect of policing, what we know, what we don't know uh, about tear gas, uh, about uh, um, the way in which to handle uh, uh, a bar fight or a domestic disturbance uh, or a riot, um, all of these things have research associated with them, and if we're teaching police how to do the fundamentals of police work, we can teach them more than just do what I say, um, but also here's the facts, here's the research that shows it's better to do it this way than to do it that way. I think if there was a Brazilian state that would create a police academy in which every police recruit from the first day would be taught the method of science, the method of law alongside the method of science. And the method of law says this is the doctrine. This is what's right, this is what's wrong. All you have to do is memorize that. And it's not going to change unless the legislature changes the law. Over here is science. Science is about a hypothesis, a theory. And you test the theory, and if you get the result that tells you, okay, the test says I should do this, so I'll do this, and then in a different context, you test the theory again, 
and you get a different result. It says, no, that doesn't work well in this particular situation. What works for controlling robbery doesn't work for controlling bar fights. So I have to do something different for the bar fights. Let's have a hypothesis, let's test that. Maybe we can reduce people guy getting killed by knives in bar fights, uh, as opposed to reducing robbery uh, at uh, commercial locations uh, like stores that are open all night. So we have different problems, different solutions, and when we test more than one solution for the same problem, we can compare the two. The, this much repeat offending, if we do this, or this much recurrence of crime at this location, if we do this, but there's only this much if we do that. So let's do that because there'll be less crime in the future than if we do this. That's the basic logic. If you learn that on the first day of a police academy, you have a totally different view of the world. I hypothesize that we haven't tested it yet because nobody's ever done it. But if it's done, my hypothesis would be that you infuse the scientific method in policing the way you can in a medical school. And even though there's a lot of do this, do that, do it this way, that the law provides, and even police policy would provide. You know, this is how you button your uniform. Uh, that's fine, that's doctrine. Science is not doctrine. Science can always change. Science is completely open-minded. Science is everything that you thought was true yesterday may turn out to be wrong today. But the only way you know that is by the same rules of method. So the doctrine is the rule of method of people observing, using careful measurement, using uh, peer review to monitor the practices to make sure that nobody's cheating with the data. Um, if we have good science, then we can have good policing. Without good science, we're lost. Yes, after I started in the New York City Police Department uh, by working on police corruption, um, I was assigned the task of developing training for the field internal affairs investigators whose job it was to uh, not only investigate allegations or complaints of police corruption, but also to do covert undercover surveillance and to use sting methods of offering bribes or uh, offering uh, things that the police could steal um, and then observing whether they did. Um, for the serious bribes, when the bribe was offered by an actor, somebody working for the uh, police corruption investigators, then the officers were arrested. And in my first two years in the New York City Police Department, there was a massive number of police arrested in the hundreds. And they were prosecuted, they went to prison, they lost their pensions, they lost their careers, they lost their family uh, respectability, so their whole family was shamed by it. And it came at the same time that there was a change in the culture. The uh, New York City people, long used to corruption, decided that they were fed up with it. It was associated with a drug epidemic, you know, lots of heroin. Police were selling heroin, the French Connection. They were stealing heroin from heroin dealers and becoming heroin dealers themselves. People were disgusted with the police. And the mayor and the journalists were in a coalition to uh, reform the way police were doing business. And that um, combination of the high level consensus that we have to stop corruption and the technical methods of uh, catching police in the act, uh, not just through the sting method, but also through uh, the spies, the field associates who were recruited in the police academy with the idea that they would give reports to the um, the police investigators, the corruption investigators, called internal affairs, uh, they would meet in midnight uh, settings in garages and other places where they couldn't be observed. And it would be intelligence. The young recruit would say, I'm suspicious of Rodrigo. He's always got a lot of cash uh, uh, on the first of the month after he talks to this gambler. Uh, and uh, he's got a white envelope that goes in his pocket. And so then the internal affairs could follow up and uh, arrange for Rodrigo to get something with marked bills that are on his hands and you know, prove the case to send Rodrigo to prison. 
Um, that's the way all of that worked technically, but it wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been high-level commitment. Right. So this became my PhD dissertation. It's a book. It's called Scandal and Reform, Controlling Police Corruption. There was a case study of four police departments. All of them had scandals over police corruption. Two of them succeeded in breaking police corruption, and the other two failed. Uh, so it's not great evidence, but it's kind of a level four design on the Maryland scale, mm -hmm. and it has a um, uh, a wonderful um, history since the book was written. We really haven't had many major scandals about police corruption in the United States. In the early 1970s, organized police corruption was widespread in all the big cities. Uh, since then. Uh, you just get an occasional outbreak of two or three officers at most, not 70. We were arresting up to 70 people at a time who were all engaged in a single corruption conspiracy to support illegal gambling in, in large parts of New York City. And those days are gone. I don't think they've come back. But it is a good example of um, a combination of innovation. Again, Patrick Murphy was the leader who put all this together. I studied it, I evaluated it, I concluded he was doing everything right, but he would say, uh, if he were alive, uh, he died some years ago, he would say he could only do it because his mayor supported him. And possibly the, the first mayor in the history of New York uh, since Teddy Roosevelt uh, was police commissioner and uh, had some falling out with the other politicians. Um, the first uh, mayor who said to a police commissioner, I want you to clean up police corruption and I really mean it. And it's possible, but I think the number one challenge in any country, first world, second world developing nations, is that the political leadership be strongly committed to having the problem stop. In 1829, the British government created its first salary police force for a major city um, in England, that was uh, London. Sir Robert Peel hired 2,000 people who were well paid um, and who were told they couldn't drink on duty. Uh, and within the first two years, he fired over half of them because they kept drinking on duty. <laughs> but uh, very high standards and very clear mission. The mission of the police which did not include investigating crime because there was a separate force of detectives called the Bow Street Runners. Um, not unlike the arrangement in Chile where you have the Carabineros uh, and the investigative police. So in effect he created the Carabineros but for a city without guns, with nightsticks, initially not even with uniforms, but they were very tall. Most of the people in London were short from breathing so much smoke. So he hired all the, the police from the countryside where they were much taller. So they walk down through these crowds and everybody sees a tall man coming, they know it's a police officer. <laughs> so that, that had a big deterrent effect. Deterrence was what it was all about. Robert Peel said, we don't have any prisons. We have just abolished hanging for most offenses, including stealing bread. We want you to prevent crime. It is the main purpose of the police to have the absence of crime rather than the visible presence of punishment. We don't want punishment because it's costly, it's painful. We want to minimize punishment by minimizing crime. That was the founding principle that was picked up in New York City in 1844. 1844 is when the New York City police created their department on the model of what was called the London police, um, but with much more political control um, and many other differences. Um, and certainly they lost the idea of prevention in favor of the idea of kind of peacekeeping for bribes. Uh, so you can have vice, you can have uh, brothels, prostitution, you can have gambling, you can have all these things that are illegal. And the police will allow them if they're paid extra, but also if things don't get out of hand. So you can't have violence where you're doing all of this. And that was pretty much the American model. It wasn't that we um, had to change from detection to prevention so much as we just had to go back to the original mission of the police and the whole model of having a visible presence that deters people because they see that if the police come while they're committing a crime, they can get caught. And catching them and inconveniencing them 
uh, rather than hanging them, is really what worked and still does. And so now we have detailed scientific evidence that shows that the police are there for 15 minutes, even in a day, that that can last, that deterrent effect won't wear off right away. Um, and to get us to a proactive police who are proactively providing this preventive patrol around the city and proactively trying to discover who is enslaving whom, who is abusing whom in families and domestic abuse, all of the unreported high harm crime that the police can only find out by being proactive. Um, that's not new, it's old, at least in principle. What's new is having computers and other information sources to document where, when, against whom the crime is happening. It was only, from a victim perspective, it was only three years ago that the first study of the concentration of harm among a small number of victims was ever calculated. This was the Dorset Police, and they found that less than 4% of the victims in one year had accounted for 85% of the crime harm calculated by such things as the Danish Crime Harm Index or the Cambridge Crime Harm Index in England based on sentencing guidelines. So you take the number of days in prison that the crime should get and you make that the value of the crime or the cost of the crime and then you add it all up and that's your crime harm index. That's very important for prevention. It's a new way to do it. It's an old idea. And if we go back to our roots, the fundamentals of preventive policing are the way out of this endless pattern of people calling up the police saying somebody's just been shot, the police get there, they either find out who shot them or they didn't uh, or they don't, and that's it. They're, they're not trying to proactively prevent uh, homicide. And, and this is the big tipping point that we have to achieve in policing and that the Danish police are working very hard uh, through their eight-year effort now to move uh, Denmark away from just answering the phone and saying, okay, we'll write that down, and then going on to the next phone call, where in effect the police become a bookkeeping agency. Uh, you might as well hire an auditing firm to, to do that, as opposed to trying to use that information to predict where, when, and against whom bad things will happen. And if you know where, when, and against whom something bad is going to happen, you can take preventive action. If you know that it's going to rain, you wear uh, an umbrella, or you bring an umbrella. If you know it's going to rain, you bring an umbrella. If you know that somebody is about to be re-victimized by their stepfather or their brother or uh, their gang leader, then you take preventive action uh, one way or another to stop that victimization from occurring. Prevention through proactive policing. The three P's are something that we achieve by the three T's of targeting those most at risk uh, at the highest harm levels testing what works to protect those people, and then tracking what the police are doing uh, to prevent those crimes based on what has been tested. And when we try to say that in Spanish, it doesn't come out to be three T's. I hope it does in Portuguese.